Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. And welcome to today's show. Have you ever been in a spot where you think that what you have done in your career, the path you've taken, really is turning out not to be the path that you thought it would be? There's a lot of people in that genre right now. In fact, uh, some of the clients that I've been coaching in the last, I'd say, five or seven years, I'm getting more people who are saying things like that. Gee, Valerie, I, I want to do a transition of some kind. I'm, I'm either realizing that what I'm doing now isn't really what I want to do, or there are people who are beginning. They're even at that stage where they're starting their career, and as they do, they're realizing there must be something else. Maybe you've had those thoughts. Here's the time to listen to the man that's been there, done it. And now, Scott Zarrett, all the way from Denver, where I know it's cooler than in Dallas, is the president of CPA Academy. Welcome, Scott. Thank you very much, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be here. You, um, at this point, you are doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. You're very successful, but you have been called a disruptor. So what's that about? That's a good question. Disruption is an interesting uh, definition. Um, usually the person who is the disruptor isn't the one who is who's defining themselves as such. It's usually others that, that, uh, that do so. I never set out to be a disruptor. Um, it was never my intention to, um, or even a, a dream of mine to be able to, to change anything in a, in a meaningful way in the educational field of accounting. Um, I got into online education because of a passion that I had and experiences that I had earlier in life that were working very well for me. And I felt that I had an idea that was worth exploring and set out to do it. I was at a, a good place to do it. And um, eight years later, uh, I think the way that I could perhaps define disruption best is that we have had a meaningful impact in the accounting profession uh, and others are responding uh, to what we're doing uh, by trying to uh, themselves, in many cases, lower the cost of CPE and bring it down to a point where it's free. Well, Scott, what I know about uh, your work in CPA Academy is that, first of all, you are the leader in education, providing it for free. So that sounds just like, how in the world could he possibly do that? Where did that inspiration come from? Sure. So it really came about because I needed a tool for myself. So I am a CPA. I come from a family of CPAs. Both my father and grandfather were in the accounting profession. So I followed suit, went to college and got a degree in accounting and passed the CPA exam and started out working for a public accounting firm in Maryland, where I lived at the time. And really, it wasn't what I had thought it was going to be. Um, it was really... Um, not my passion. Uh, I was doing a job, I was getting paid for it, but I uh, really couldn't imagine spending a lifetime um, doing what I was doing. And really, I thought that I had made a, a, a mistake, um, you know, in, in choosing a path that I wasn't excited about while I watched many friends go on and, and enjoy their careers and, and excel in, in more interesting ways as far as I was concerned. And so I was really looking for um, uh, I was looking for something of my own, something that I can call my own. And it took a lot of stumbling around, a lot of jobs that didn't necessarily lead me to where I wanted to, to be. Um, it was, uh, I was getting my joy from other areas of life, from mountain biking and the friendships that I had. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't really my, my passion. And so it took me a long time to really figure out what it was that, that I wanted to do. Well, we're going to go much more in depth on that, Scott. I want to stay with the fact that right now, you are very successful, and I'd like for you to just kind of discuss with me, was that because of timing? Was your success being at the right place at the right time? Was it luck? I mean, the success you have, how did, how did it come about? 
It were there were a lot of there were a lot of steps that that had to transpire before um, I even came close to getting to the starting point. Uh, for me, I, I mentioned that I was sort of uh, looking for something something new, um, and I had been working for a company for approximately eight years, doing something that I was that I that I felt uh, was interesting. I was selling to CPAs, and I enjoyed doing so, and. Um, one of the things that I had experimented with at my old employer was using online education as a tool to generate new leads and, and get exposure. And it hit me like a ton of bricks one day that I had a great idea uh, or that this idea that I, I really what I should say is that what I was doing worked very effectively. And I thought that there was an opportunity to be able to take this idea to others. I didn't feel like um, the idea of using education to position myself as a thought leader to sell services was unique. And uh, I really wanted to test that idea. I did have um, uh, very good timing um, and I think a bit of luck as well. Um, I uh, had noticed a lot of trends that were going on um, globally, uh, including the world being flattened. Um, I noticed that online education uh, was becoming more inexpensive to produce. The barriers to entry were lessened and that it was a big business and providing continuing education to others. And I felt like there was an, an oppor opportunity there. So I think the timing was good uh, in terms of online education really becoming more and more popular. Um, there certainly was a bit of luck uh, involved, um, but uh, I think um, luck is a funny word. I think the more prepared you are, the, the less lucky perhaps you get. But I also think there's, there's such a thing as just, just good old fashioned luck. Um, and uh, I'd have to, um, I'd have to say that um, that I think that that did account for a portion of the success. I love the word luck. They say that's when uh, preparedness meets opportunity. Sure. So I'm going to go back to that because in talking with you before the show and um, looking at all the things that you're doing it was a lot more than luck in terms of how you started out so tell us about that you you went to college you got your and difficult difficult right to get your cpa exam completed right you did that yeah, definitely. <laughs> how many times did it take three uh-huh and that's not unusual is it i mean i don't know anyone that passes the first time yeah, so that was I, uh, I was I was happy to pass on that third time. So the, the, first one, the first one was the most challenging. It got easier after that. But OK, so uh, that even the first. I'm sorry, Scott, even that think about just what you said. It took you three times. What kind of grit did you have to have to keep going? Gosh, I mean, the pressure was was great. Uh, you know, when you put something out to the world that you're going to do something, pass the CPA exam or anything else, start a business, uh, and it's out in the universe, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. It creates an accountability. And so you put pressure on yourself and you want to, um, you know, you just want to succeed. And um, it, it, was, it was difficult for me. I'm not going to pretend it, it wasn't. Uh, I remember, I don't know, just the, even the, um, I remember having like a little, like a little tick in my brain. It, it was like a, a pulsing sensation. I thought this can't be good. This is what stress feels like, and uh, it was quite a relief to to pass and only to get to my first job in uh, public accounting. And go, ah, oh, I don't even know what I want to do with this degree now that I have it. And uh, then realizing that uh, maybe getting it wasn't all that it uh, was cracked up to be, but certainly it was nice to have those initials after my name. All right, so you got that first job. And what you just said was that you found an avenue, and this is me saying to you, obviously you have the skill and uh, the ability to get in front of audiences. You mm -hmm. really were almost a speaker at that point, weren't you? Getting in front of audiences and using um, that as a vehicle for sales. Is that correct? Well, my first job was more of a straight uh, public accounting job starting at the entry level. And I had a, a series of jobs uh, from there that were, I think, all steps in the right direction, um, but none of them a true passion. It wasn't really until I started, and, and actually it was a cousin of mine. I mentioned my father and grandfather were accountants, but I had, a, I had a cousin as well who owned an accounting practice, and he gave me an idea to say that I think there's an opportunity to sell a particular service. It was real estate tax related to accountants, and I really wanted to give it a go. Um, I was at a stage in my life where I had the chance to do it. I was at the right age. I had 
savings and, and took a chance with it and realized that for me, the, uh, at that point, the best way for me to get in front of CPAs to sell was by uh, educating. And this mm -hmm. was way before webinars were commonplace and I was doing the old fashioned things such as cold calls and going to CPA's offices and, and meeting with them and, and going to conferences at a certain point and even hosting a, a conference uh, here in Denver where I live. And all these things were, were effective uh, eventually when I had, had really built the skill set for them, but none of them were fully scalable. And so it was really through those, those experiences that I realized that as much as I enjoyed selling, that I was really looking for a much more uh, scalable way to do so. And it was around that time that webinars were really coming into, uh, into popularity, thanks to um, it really the software improving. So when I say luck, I mean, I was lucky that at that particular time, go to webinar, WebEx, all those who were fairly young uh, when I, um, at, at that period of my life, which was 16 years ago, were really becoming much more powerful and, and scalable themselves and, and practical and, and others were really not fearful of using online education um, as attendees. And so that was really the first opportunity I had was to present these, these webinars. And even at that time, I didn't consider myself to be an expert in the subject that I was teaching. And so I did rely a lot on transcripts. Um, I was literally doing webinars, but I was acting them out. Uh, I didn't have the um, the skill set as uh, like the partners of the firm I was working for to be able to um, to present as effectively. And so I used transcripts and and really learned the um, what worked for me in terms of literally acting out these um, these presentations. But eventually, I became confident with the material and started teaching them without. Without the um, without notes, and I was very effective. And I think the more authentic well, I know, the more authentic that I was, and, and the more natural that I was, and um, embedding my own personality, the more effective they were. And I did that for eight years, and uh, as an employee. And so, at one point, I, I I mean, it almost hit me like a like a ton of bricks. I mean, I remember um, I remember the day that I was sitting there, and I was like, wait a second. What I'm doing here again is, is something that others can do, and others were in a in a much smaller scale. I mean, there were many companies that were doing webinars. I shouldn't um, give any other impression, but it wasn't. There was no single shared platform where people can go find content um, and be able to take those classes for free. And so that's really where the idea was born. Of you know, I I'm doing this as an employee. It's working really well, but um, what if I were to take this and make it my own and create a platform and and offer this ability to others and uh, it turns out that others were ripe. It was a, the timing was was very good, and and um, very others were very open to the idea of being involved in presenting on a platform where others could find them as well. So what that says to me, Scott, is that you were um, very aware of that moment when the dots connected, right? Absolutely. Oh yeah, it was. It was, all, it was one of those moments like, why didn't I think of this before? I mean, it, often the things that are right in front of your face um, aren't so obvious. I don't know why that is. Um, but yeah, it was one of those moments. And I, quite frankly, I think a lot of it had to do with just my mindset at the time. My wife, um, we were expecting a child. And I think with that, you start to, at least for me, I could say that I started to question like, where am I going in my career? What kind of example am I going to set for mm -hmm for my to be born son, you know, what kind of uh, message do I want to send? I knew I always wanted to do something more than, than be an employee for someone and, and build up their business. And I think I got to the point where I could have gone two ways. I could have said, well, I have a child being born and I better make sure that I buckle down and, and secure a, a, a salary job and, and take the conservative path. Or I can look at life and say, things are going to be different uh, without question, no matter what I do uh, with a, with a child being born, uh, life is, is going to change drastically and what better time uh, to really uh, reinvent yourself than um, when you're going through a rite of passage like that. And that was, that was how I viewed it. So I think it was the mindset that I had at the time, the openness to, to do something different, uh, the, the risk of not, being the person that I wanted to to be and tell my son, you know, I would never want to be in a position where years down the road, I would say, well, the reason I didn't do it is because I couldn't because I didn't want to um, 
jeopardize uh, our family's l livelihood um, mm -hmm. and use that as an excuse. And so I felt I felt the timing was actually perfect. Whereas I think others were like, are you crazy? You're having a child and now is the time you want to start a new business and you're 37 years old and you've never done that before. And uh, I had, uh, I think was very healthy. I think it was helpful for me to have that pushback and be able to explain, no, I'm doing this because I see this as a, as a path to, uh, to success. And even if I don't succeed on this endeavor of starting a new business, at least I'm putting myself out to the world that I'm interested in online education. And at least I'll land a job with a company that, that shares that belief. So it wasn't like I had, um, was going to invest a ton of money into something that if it didn't work would have literally gotten byproduct, no, no, no benefits. So I did feel like it was a calculated decision. Um, but again, like the CPA exam, you don't want to fail and you put that out to the world and you tell people you're going to do things and you know they're going to ask you how things are going you want to be able to genuinely say things are going well i'm excited i'm having fun and and it was an extremely stressful time um having a, a child in the world having a wife who was still finishing her phd um living in a house that was too small um a, a lot of things going on that um gosh uh, i'm glad i went through but uh Sometimes I'm not sure how, how we got through it. But you got through it. And I, I want to know if you can tell our listeners and me too, what do you think it takes to be an entrepreneur? You are one, you are successful. You mm -hmm. handled the stress and you said it really was stressful. I'm sure it affected your family, didn't it? Oh, without question. There, there are a number of things that in my, in my case had to take place before I was able to really, to really quit my job and, and get started. And for me, um, you know, I think having, you know, having that great idea was really important, but having a great support system um, was extremely important. My wife was uh, nothing but encouraging. And I, I think really, um, our, we were, I, I've only been married nine years. Um, so this was only a few years into our relationship. Um, so, you know, still really getting to know what the tolerance for risk is, but my wife is one of those people that doesn't have her life mapped out in a very positive way. She doesn't, you know, she's, um, she's hard to define. Uh, she's constantly reinventing herself and, and, um, she's a student, she's a teacher literally for, for, uh, the local unit or for, uh, University of Colorado. Um, but, you know, I think we came from the mindset of, um, you know, life doesn't have to be, uh, I'm going to take a job and work at it for 20 years. Well, thank goodness you've got that kind of a support. Not everyone does. But I'm going to go back to specifically. I'd love for mm -hmm. you just to give us some tips. Somebody's out there listening and they're in the boat that you were in, sort of yeah. like I, you know, I don't know. I'm really wanting to continue doing what I'm doing. Yeah. There's some, there's some things that we've got to think about. I, I remember someone said to me this, Scott, once years ago, and it, it kind of took me aback. So I'll start this conversation with the story, which is this. She said, Valerie, did you ever consider failing? Huh, yeah. And honestly, it, I, I did just that. I went, <laughs> and I answered pretty quickly and said, no. And I meant it because I just knew it, there was this, there was this sense of I've got to. Of course, it's going to be successful. I'm going to make yeah. it happen, right? So that may be one aspect. But give us some things that, before you make any shift, what do we need to have in our in our very being to be a successful entrepreneur? Sure. So you know, there's. <laughs> It's never, I didn't feel black and white. There was nothing that, uh, no one anointed me and said, you, you know, you've got what it takes to be an entrepreneur now, now go young man, travel west. I mean, there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing like that. There was no expectation uh, of doing so. Um, I don't have a, I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. So this was, this was definitely something that, um, gosh, it just, it takes knowing yourself, I think, and being really honest with, with who you are and the kind of, um, the kind of cards you've been you've been dealt or at least that your um, uh, infrastructure you're, you're able to build for yourself and so i think that um you know having a great idea is is critical i think being able to bounce that idea off of people that you respect is important i think building a network of people who uh, you can confide in um, and meet with and and get uh, ideas from is extremely important um, because you can speak to any entrepreneur and ask them you know tell me your story and most of them 
uh, if not all of them, are going to be thrilled to tell you their success story and give you a bit of, of advice. And so I did, almost before I quit my job, I, I went on sort of on a road show and met with people that I consider to be successful and said, can you you know, I'm looking to do, I'm, I am looking to do in, in many ways what you've done. I'm look, you know, you've taken the leap, you started your own thing. What can you share with me about your experiences? And uh, all of those people obviously had, had stories to share and all of them were inspiring to me. And so I had, you know, the, uh, that, that support stru uh, structure, but I think it's also the grit because no matter what your expectations are, yes, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. This is this is the new me. Um, you're going to go through dark days, and there are going to be uh, you're going to leave your job, and the day is going to come where you don't get that check on that Friday, and the bills are still coming in, and you're you're spending money uh, to build up your infrastructure, and it's coming out of savings, and you're not sure any of that is going to be recovered. And I don't think I could say to you that I had 100% confidence that it was going to work, and I think. That, that was just me. Maybe others have a, uh, a different sense of, um, you know, of their path. But, you know, in the beginning, work-life balance doesn't, doesn't exist. Uh, it didn't for me, at least. Yeah. You know, that idea was, you know, just theoretical. But it was constant working around the clock. It was uh, ulcers. It was, uh, you know, thing, things of that nature um, that are really difficult. Things that I would never want to change in retrospect. But I think that... Um, at least I knew myself enough to know that I had the grit and it, it wasn't just because of the CPA exam. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have passed the CPA exam um, and very few uh, are entrepreneurs or, or want to be entrepreneurs. Um, for me, I think an easy analogy was, you know, that I is knowing that you've got some sort of history, something that tells you that you've 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 dealt with a challenge. You've had a challenge in front of you. You've dealt with it and you enjoyed it. And that you didn't you didn't quit when when the going got tough and and um, you know for me that example uh, oddly enough was uh, mountain biking so that's a huge part of of who I am and maybe not some more now that I have a couple of kids but it is the um, um, it, it's a very important part of my history and so I think that from the um, the many long distance trips that I've done and. And tours and races that I've um, that I've done, um, I, I know what it's like to be at least in the pain cave. You know what it's like to uh, want to quit, um, but at that moment, knowing that what you actually have to do is push even harder, um, and that literally just like uh, like life, people are literally going by you. It is a rat race. I mean, people are literally going by you on a bike, and just when you want to quit, you've got to try to catch up to them or pass them. And I think that um, for me, you know those those lessons of um, just con just continuing just because, you know, you said you're going to do it, now you're going to continue to do it and you're not going to quit unless literally you uh, get in an accident, break your leg or your bike breaks down. There's no other reason that you would ever stop. And I think that um, it, to be successful, I think it really takes uh, an openness to dealing with that, um, to dealing with those, those kinds of, of challenges. I think that analogy plays out in, in, in many different ways. That's a great visual. I'm not a mountain biker, but I can sure feel the pain. And you said you had a thing up here the, when you were taking the exam. Yeah, you went through some of that. And we do. There's ups and downs. And so at this stage of, of your life, what kind of things are you doing right, doing it right? What am I doing right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, I'm happy, so that's got to – that's got to account for something, you know, I feel like I don't take this, you know, I don't take this opportunity for granted. You know, when I first started, there was nothing there, right? I mean, you have a dream and you want it to, you want it, you want to see it through um, and you'll do anything to make that happen. And then you get to a point where it is working and you'll do anything to protect it. And, you know, what you're protecting is really the livelihood that you've created. In my case, you know, I, I have a passion for what I do. And I want to have as many days of that as possible or years or a lifetime of it as, as possible. And I think that, you know, if you can get to the point where you're passionate about what you do, which is critical, um, that you are getting paid fairly for what you're doing um, and be able to provide a livelihood for your family, uh, that's critical as well. Um, at some point, you've got to be able to, uh, in my case, I mean, I, I, have a res I feel a responsibility to be able to, uh, to provide. Um, and I think the most 
one of the most important things is is that you make a difference in the world in a positive way, right? You could, uh, it's it's an honest it's an honest buck. I mean, it is really you know we're, I'm very proud of what what we do and what we give back to the accounting profession. And so I think all of these things really add up for feeling like I'm doing it right. It's not just about making money. It's not just about being excited and not making money. I mean, it really all of these things have to have to play a part. And and I'm I get validation in ways that I think most don't. I mean, I get it from not only my clients but from our members. Um, and and uh, I'm obviously. Um, happy myself. So I mean, it's all the parties that are involved in in, in this endeavor are happy with the experience. And I, I literally woke up this morning to a random message saying, "I'm a member of your platform, and I want to thank you for putting out uh, the high quality CPE that you do." And and I wake up to, to, to messages like that regularly, and I don't take that for granted. My wife is in the educational field as well, but at the um, pu in the public school arena, and there's not a lot of validation. It's constant. You know, it's the opposite. It's nothing is ever good enough and schools are, you know, schools are struggling and, you know, who's to blame and how are we going to fix it? And and I know that this isn't something that just automatically happens. So I, um, you know, I know that I'm doing it right in my view because the site is growing in popularity. Um, we are constantly bringing in new members, hundreds a day, and um, and I'm having fun doing it. <laughs> you're so real. You're just, you know, you're just telling it like it is, and that's so great. Just to be clear, though, for our listeners, I went on the site, of course, and obviously uh, CPAs have to have, what, 40 hours a year of um, education? And on average, what I yeah. Right. So you have on your website, which is cpaacademy.org, what mm -hmm. impressed me was I can go on there if I'm a CPA, and I can listen to other presenters. You're bringing in people like me or other experts in their field, and they're the right. ones, really, that are giving the expertise to the people who are listening to the webinars. Now, my question to you is, so I, I as I perused it, Scott, I thought, oh boy, I wanna listen to this one. There were a lot on leadership. There were some things on sales. There were some, it wasn't just CPA-ish. And so right. if I or anyone else wanted to listen to these uh, webinars, could we? Absolutely, I mean, that is the, that is the model. So, you know, going to the site, uh, one of the things that I think would strike most people is that uh, it's free to create an account. It is free to take as many courses as you want and to earn credit if credit is applicable to you. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone who's taking classes is a CPA. Uh, many of the classes there are, uh, like you described, on personal development or other areas that are highly relatable, whether it's Excel or any other uh, number of topics. But we've done over 1,500 topics, unique topics. Um, Going, ranging from very technical, so something that maybe only a CPA would care about, something that would be over the head of, of many, um, all the way through to to very basic, uh, or I shouldn't say basic, but um, you know, it, more uh, um, entry level type uh, type folks. You know, someone who just passed the CPA exam, for example. But we also have a lot of classes on thought leadership that are on our site, and we have a lot of classes that are software demos. And it's really, fortunately, in the accounting profession, there, there are, I think, 23 different fields of study that you could, you could potentially fall within, and which leaves the door open for just about any, any number of topics. Um, really, anything that can help a, a business owner improve in their practice is allowable for continuing education for, for CPAs. But the idea is that um, there's something there for everybody, and including me. And you know, one of the, the, one of the joys of running the site is that uh, I'm constantly getting advice and and business tips from the people who present on our platform, uh, who I you know fortunate enough to be able to call my friends. And so if I need motivation or inspiration, I literally can log into a class. I know exactly how the class performed in terms of attendance and ratings. And there are many classes of, on our own platform that I take and uh, help help me out at a personal level. And so I think there's really um, we're very proud of of the diversity of the classes uh, that we offer that we offer on the site. 
What a great resource we just now came to. We can do YouTube, we can do all these other TED Talks, and now we've got yours, and that's great. So one more question, Scott, I think is kind of a fun question, which is sure. you're into technology. I'd love to know who do you follow on social media? You know, I, I like more in-depth content, and so that's why you know I was mentioning earlier that a lot of the things that I listen to are really the the longer sessions, the one-hour sessions. Many of that we host, Gene Marks, Darren Root, you know, people of that nature in the accounting profession, who really have a tremendous amount of substance. And outside of that, the types of media that I'm attracted to um, are really uh, sometimes magazines. Fast Company is one of my favorites. Um, I love in terms of podcasts, NPR is how I built this. Wonderful stories there about uh, folks who have struggled and and made it through to the other side. Huge fan of um, of authors like Clayton Christensen who who um, have really mastered the art of disruption or in, in explaining it. Ray Dalio, uh, I like a lot. Um, who talks about uh, principles and so there's many YouTube videos on on him. Uh, lots of little things like Khan Academy. You mentioned YouTube. Um, I mean, I, I do use all of those resources personally and Wikipedia and, and look up to those as being the, the um, inspiration for essentially f free education. Wow. That, you've just given us a lot more resources, so thank you for that. I've, I'll go back and listen and write them down, and now I've got some other <laughs> podcasts and things to read and so forth, so that's great. You know, the one other thing I wanted to say that meant so much to me in what you did, you reached out, you said to experts. Scott, there are a lot of people, including me, I had to, and it's still hard for me, to ask. I was just talking to a woman a couple of weeks ago, and she said, I just, I feel like if I go up to a senior leader, I'm taking their precious time. Yeah. And one time I did ask someone for some thoughts, and here's what he said to me that I'll never forget. It was a turning point. I always, if I asked anybody, I would say, and so, and what can I do for you? And he stopped me. I thought that was a nice thing to say, and I really meant it. He stopped me, Scott, and he said, why do you always have to say something to give back? Take what I'm giving you. I don't want mm. anything back. Yeah. And it was such, right, it was such a turning point to say, as you did, they are willing, people are willing to give advice. When someone comes to me for advice now at this sure. stage of my life, I'm thrilled. It makes me happy. It makes me feel good that I have something to share. So right. that was a tip, and I, I really do thank you for that. I can't wait to go on to your site. I'm going to listen to some of those experts on uh, leadership development, since that's my area of expertise, and many of the others, I'm sure. So is there anything else you want to leave us with before we close it out and let you get back to your family? I No, I, I, I well, yes, I, I mean, I appreciate your, your final comment on asking for advice and knowing how to, to go about reaching out to people who you look up to maybe a bit intimidating. Um, I can relate to that completely. And I think that, you know, really for me, um, asking for advice was one of the, knowing who to ask and how to ask for advice is, was really one of the, the keys for success. You don't do this alone. You don't do, um, you don't start a business uh, um, on your own. There are going to be a, uh, a lot of people that are involved, some who you may not even may not even come to appreciate for, for years down the road. Um, you know, eight years ago when I started this, I didn't know anyone in the accounting profession outside of the firm uh, that I work for. Uh, a couple of years after I started, I was going to parties and, and really networking with folks who I looked up to, people that were, um, that I constantly saw on stage as keynote speakers and others. And I was, it was kind of intimidating too. You realize, you, you ask, what can I contribute to them? I mean, these folks seem to walk on water and, and um, it is a little bit intimidating to try to interrupt them when they're speaking to someone else who you feel the same way about. Um, yet I think you need to figure out how to, um, you know, how to embed yourselves in those conversations, how to be able to earn respect uh, from those folks in your own, you know, in your own special way. And now, you know, I feel like the, I'm extremely fortunate in the people that I've surrounded myself with. And, and um, I feel like those folks continue to keep me, you know, headed in the right direction and provide candid feedback and um you know although they remain unnamed there are so many uh people that 
who, whose advice I, I rely on. And I think that at a certain stage in, in one's career, sometimes you, sometimes it happens later in life, but there is definitely a feeling of, okay, others help me. I'm well aware of that. And now it's time to pay it forward. And I think that many of the folks that I've met um, are honored and, and validated to be asked those questions and feel somewhat of an obligation to say others built me up and got me to where I am. And now it's my responsibility to, to pay it forward and to help them as well. And so if you could determine who's got that, that mindset and know who's who, um, I think you'll find that you could befriend a lot of people and, and uh, build yourself a, a, you know, a powerful network of people that really do have your back and, and know how to help you. Scott, thank you for that. And you know, some of our best conversations happen after the podcast. And so I want to appreciate you being with us today and wish you continued success, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. And I'll leave you with saying, because so many of our comments happen after the fact, I want you to be sure if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do so and leave comments. And um, I'd also like to say, and review, leave a review. I read all of those. It's really important. Also, tag me on your Instagram story and hashtag the Doing It Right podcast. I want to know what impact this show has on you. That's what's important to me. And that's why I appreciate so much those of you who have subscribed, shared, reviewed, and all of that, and led us to be one of the top 25 uh, Apple podcast business podcasts. And thank you for all of that. In the meantime, until next week, just stay authentic. And you now have an action step to take. Go find somebody in your industry that's an expert and get to know that person. You never know where luck will happen. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.